everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of IEFR to the talk session with Dr. Uday Saxena. I'm so excited and happy to introduce my mentor, Dr. Uday. He is a founder of Indira Ishwar Foundation for Research and co-founder of a cutting-edge biotech company, Riagin Innovations. He is a chair product development committee at Bharat Advanced Therapeutics and he is also a strategic advisor at Insilico Mines. He is an executive and se executive secretary at Federation of Asian Biotech Associations. He has held executive and leadership level positions at Atherogenics, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories and Cas okay. Therapeutics. He was associated with the team at Pfizer that discovered Lipito, the largest selling drug in the pharma business. And he has been filed over 30 global patents. His scientific and business interests are in the area of new drug discovery, nutraceuticals, antibody therapies, novel diagnostics. Let's begin with the session on the crucial topic, how to be an entrepreneur. So welcome. Thank you so much, Saranya, and thank you um, everybody for joining. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will go ahead and show my uh, share my screen. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you everybody for joining. So this is a very very preliminary, not preliminary, but a very easy to understand um, talk on how to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I think in 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 India now we have more than five thousand biotech startups. This is something that's you know it's gone very very fast and vigorously. And it's a whole new opportunity for young people who are interested. Uh, you know, when I was establishing my career, it was doing a job. Uh, they may or may not do a job, but directly go and start their own startup. So that's the culture that India is now uh, having, which is brilliant because this is exactly what used to happen in the U.S. back in the 80s and 90s. And that's why companies like Genentech and Amgen, they were all startups. They were one time at startups and now they have become unicorns. So it takes a while to become a startup, but some of these startups will go ahead and become multi-billion dollar companies. So entrepreneurship is very exciting, but as I'll tell you, it's also not easy. Uh, Gopi is a great example of being an entrepreneur. Uh, Gopi is my partner at IFER. Uh, he has a PhD, but he has worked in industry and then decided to start his own company. And for the last uh, five, six, six, seven years that I know him, he's been very successfully running his company. So, uh, you know, it's a great example of the new generation where people are starting their own companies. So, so I want to tell you about two things. Uh, one is what exactly is entrepreneurship? It seems like a very glamorous word these days. Uh, everybody's talking about, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a this, I'm that. So, but what exactly is an entrepreneur? Let's try and understand that. And uh, specifically, I want to talk about entrepreneurship in India. What And I what I think is going to be the future, because uh, this is very, very similar to what happened in the 80s and 90s in the U.S., and I think that's how it's going to be in India, too. So those are the two main topics we will cover. So if you look at the dictionary version of what's entrepreneurship, uh, it's defined as an activity of setting up a business and taking a financial risk in the hope of making money. It's as simple as that. You have you an individual who has an idea and puts money on that idea to develop a product taking a risk in the hope that one day that product will make money for him. So the whole uh, concept of taking a financial risk on an idea to make money is called entrepreneurship. This is very different from uh, charity, uh, like IFER Foundation is more of a charitable where we have no intention of making money, we are doing things. So entrepreneurship is very different than just being a foundation or uh, being a charity. So. As I said, it involves converting an innovation into a product. Um, that's what entrepreneurs do. And the innovation is a big part of it. So uh, there is also service industry that people work on, but those are not really considered entrepreneurship. They are considered more of, you know, service industry. So innovation has to be a big part of being an entrepreneur. So you have to have a new idea that people will buy the product and make money off of, right? So that's a key fundamental. One is the risk. The other is having a new idea for a new product that people will buy. So the two go hand in hand. And innovation doesn't have to be like discovering a new vaccine, right? It doesn't have to be that big. It can be very simple too. And that's called incremental innovation. So incremental innovation, a great example is this company called Nayaka, which I think two years back had an IPO very successful company. All it is is a portal 
where you can go on, on to their web portal and order supplies for women. So they found a niche for selling women cosmetics, right? So, and that has done extremely well. So that's an incremental innovation, which is very successful. There's also something called disruptive innovation, which changes the whole industry. Uh, Nayaka did not change the industry. It just focused more on products for women. Disruptive is the COVID vaccines that India produced, right? Nobody else had it before, and millions of people's lives were saved. So that is more uh, disruptive. So there can be two different kinds. There's nothing wrong in being an incremental, and we'll see more examples of incremental and disruptive. Or you can be disruptive. It just depends on your product. The ultimate goal of any entrepreneur is to provide a product that people will buy for. If you have an idea that people will pay for for your product, that's going to be a success. If your idea, nobody wants to pay for it, however good the idea might be, uh, I think it's very likely going to fail. So you have to be really careful whether your product really has a demand or not. So this is a typical roadmap of how people start startups and take the from an idea into a product. If you look at the brown boxes, the first is having a new product idea. And as I said, the product could be incremental or it could be uh, disruptive. Uh, the second is analysis of whether this is a marketable product or not. So will people buy or not? I'll give you an example of um, an idea that is was not marketable. There's an Indian company, um, you know, aspirin. Aspirin probably, it's used for headache. It is white in color and it probably costs 10 paisa, I don't know, whatever. So there's this Indian company that said, uh, why not we make aspirin in blue color for men and pink color for women? And I mean, they just wanted to have it. And unfortunately, that product didn't work because as a patient, nobody cared for the color. And as it is, it's going to be 10 paisa and you can't really make too much money. So that idea failed. So you have to be very careful in evaluating whether your idea uh, would make a product and make money or not. Generally, if you have a very breakthrough innovation, the likelihood of making money is much higher, right? The risk may be higher, but making money is much more likely, like the vaccine thing. The COVID vaccine that was so brand new from India, it you know potentially changed lives and made lots of money. The next thing you need to do is, it's not just about science and idea. You have to have a business plan. So what is a business plan? Very simply, business plan is uh, we will, this is our product, we have done our market research, we will make it here and then we'll sell it through either stores or through internet or door to door, whatever. And how much money would we spend and how much money would we make? It's, it's very simple, but that amount of business planning is critical to start any business at all. Uh, without a business plan of how much what is needed, how much will it take, when will I make money, uh, we are very likely to fail if you don't have that. So don't just run because you think you have a good idea. You have to do a lot of careful homework before you do that. The other element is having a solid team. Uh, no one individual can, very unlikely that he or she can really run with a company. So you need a team, people that come together and provide different, uh, you know, skill sets that you don't have. And uh, the final thing is at the end of the day, you have to have a plan for making sales and monetizing. If you are not able to sell the product and make money, your business is going to fail. So uh, this is really the basic steps that you must follow. Um, and innovation as seen in the bu bullet points, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship can be in any field, science, medicine, engineering, IT, whatever, finance. Now, FinTech is here, which is really innovation and finance field. And um, we also talked about this, you know, uh, innovation can be incremental or disruptive. So let me give you another example of incremental. You know, wheelchair, for example, there are now the old wheelchair people had to push it, right? But with some incremental innovation, they now have wheelchairs that can be self-propelled. So the individual who is using doesn't need somebody to push him. It's just that it is motorized and he can guide it. So while it might, it's an incremental, it really took off. I mean, that changed the lives. The quality of life of people changed as a result of which they started to buy the product. So you have to provide some value to the people to, before they can buy. And fantastic examples of uh, incremental innovation that became disruptive are Uber and Squ Swiggy. If you look at what is Uber, Uber is nothing but an app, a portal where you can 
you know, Uber doesn't own really the taxis. Uber doesn't own the uh, Uber doesn't own the drivers. Nothing. All they are doing is they are allowing you to connect with a taxi person who's available. It's an incremental innovation from the face of it, but it has really changed the lives. You know, all of our lives. Can you imagine without Uber where we would have been? Right, getting a taxi would have just old fashioned way would have been very very difficult. So Uber really changed the transportation. Uh, feel through a very incremental innovation, they become disruptive. Disruptive is any technology that totally changes the business. So the taxi business before and after Uber is completely different. Swiggy is there for food. Uh, previously, you had to call the hotel and they may or may not deliver. Swiggy through a simple app, again, has changed the whole thing. So your ideas don't have to be Nobel Prize winning level or, you know, fantastic. They just have to provide a uh, product or a service to people that who will pay for it. So that's the whole thing, you know. So don't worry whether your idea is breakthrough or whether it's incremental. What you have to really do your research about is can this can people pay for this or not? And I think Uber and Swiggy are great examples of incremental innovation that has changed the way our lives uh, we lead our lives. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about the biotech industry because that's what we do. You know, all of us here are from the biotech industry. It's I showed you different steps for a typical starting a typical business and taking it forward, right? Even in uh, the journey from an idea to a drug, which is on the, I mean, you see drugs now, you go buy drugs in the pharmacy. They actually started their whole thing as an idea in somebody's mind, as, as an idea in a scientist's mind saying, you know, I can stop heart disease because I know this causes heart disease. So if I stop it, I might be able to prevent heart disease. Whatever the idea might be, uh, it's the drugs that you see in the marketplace today didn't just appear from a tree or from somebody's, you know, uh, warehouse. They started as an idea. And so the idea that people work on in biotech, there are three phases. One is called discovery innovation and showing that the idea works. Um, this takes about one to three years. Um, if you do it in one year, it's incredible. Uh, it needs a lot of experience and planning to get it early. Uh, then it has to move into a uh, next phase, which is called preclinical, where in animal models, you have to show it's safe and you know human beings can take it. And then finally, it moves into a clinical trial phase where you have to demonstrate that your idea or a product, the drug that you thought about, and it could be simple as I'm going to inhibit this enzyme using a drug, right? So that has to be tested, tested in clinical trials also. So if you add up all the years that it takes for an idea to get into a drug, it takes about 10 to 15 years. Not only that, it's very expensive. An average in the US, an average for a brand new drug, an average expenditure from a company um, to get a brand new drug out on the market is about $500 million. It's, it's very, very expensive. And on top of that, the odds of success. So in the stage one, your odds are one in 10,000 that your idea might work. If you go to stage two, preclinical, one in 100, get in clinical. So everything about the drug discovery business is extremely hard. It takes a long time, takes a lot of money, and the odds are pretty low. So, uh, but at the end of the day, you are providing a product that is life-saving and people will pay anything for that, right? So that's the, uh, you know, taking a high risk, but a high reward approach. So this is a very different business than Swiggy and Uber, where the risk was low. Uh, and, you know, so, but here the risk is high, but the rewards are also extremely high. I mean, the drug that I worked on called Lipitor, uh, the peak sales of the drug for many, many years were $17 billion a year, 17 billion. So if you have the right idea and if you are able to produce a drug, you will be able to make billions of dollars for the next 20 years till it is protected by a patent. So it's, it's very meaningful. Uh, this again is very different than the IT industry where the timelines and expenses, the barrier to entry in IT industry is lower so you will see a lot of activity going on in IT industry. But, you know, innovation in the biotech industry, uh, the barrier might be high, but I said reward. So there are all kinds of businesses. We happen to be, myself and I for team and Gopi, happen to be in the business of thinking of a new idea and trying to create a product.
Uh, so how do you convert an idea into product? Uh, it has three major elements. We already talked about uh, the product itself and the, the innovation, uh, innovative idea that you have. It can be incremental, it can be disruptive, whatever. But the idea needs to fulfill an unmet need, right? So the first thing you need to do is make sure just because you think it's a good idea doesn't mean it's a good idea at all. You have to talk to end users. So when we start something, we think about patients. We think about what are the other drugs on the market? Are they not good enough? Uh, we talk to patients or we, we talk to doctors. So you have to do your market research very, very carefully. Don't just jump into it because you and your two friends think it's a great idea. That's usually what happens. You know, When you're young, you're so excited. You and your two friends think, let's do it. This is the best idea I've ever heard of. And you're sitting in a Irani hotel and having chai and think that uh, that generally will not work. You have to be a little more, um, you know, systematic about that. So the next thing that comes in is financing to uh, be able to bring a product forward and market it and sell it. Uh, you will need money. And generally, the sources of money initially are friends and family. You know, your friends and family will say, yeah, I think I'll give you, I don't know, 10,000 rupees, whatever. That's how you start. That's a good way to start. That's the easiest way to start, actually. The next is what are called angel investors. So these are rich people um, who want to invest and see if they can make money, right? Some people invest in real estate. Some people invest in innovative companies. So these are called angel investors. Generally, it's an individual, generally very rich, and they have a passion for, say, medicines. So they do it. The, that's a little more difficult than uh, friends and family, and usually that's the next step. And then you have venture capital. Venture capitalists are people, these are like banks. Their whole business is to give money to startup companies, and then in return, they own part of the company. So it's called equity in a company. Uh, this is extremely cutthroat. Venture capitalists are very, very demanding um, places to get money from. They will get on, they will be part of your business. They will dictate what you need to do. They might even might control the finances. So it's a very different step than working with friends and family or an angel investor. So this venture capital is really the big league. You know, if you have gotten money from a venture capital capitalist, that means you've arrived because they do a lot of due diligence. Uh, I'll tell you, I work for a startup company in the U.S. called Atherogenics. And uh, when I was joining, venture capitalists were already there. Uh, they actually called... Uh, not just in the U.S., but they also call my professors in India saying, what kind of a guy is he? What is his character? Is he going to run away with the money? Can he take pressure? So the depth, and I never knew about that till I actually, you know, um, started working there. And some of my professors said, hey, you know, we got a call from this guy asking about you and all that. So that is very common. The due diligence that venture capitalists will do on you and your business is extremely significant. So if you're looking to seek money from venture capital, be ready to give up a big portion of the responsibility that they will really enter into the company and take over. So it's good and bad. The amount of money they give you is huge, but the bad is if you are somebody who wants to own all the business, venture capital is not for you. Then the other thing is what's going public, listing yourself in Bombay Stock Exchange, that's called an IPO. We talked about Nayaka, which is the final step. You know, not only just one or two people, but anybody on the street can buy your stock and then pay for it. So, so there are different stages. I think for a startup, really the important stages are friends and family, angel investor, and venture capital. IPO is something that, unless you don't have a lot of revenues, you're not going to do an IPO. Uh, and I think so. First thing is the idea itself. Second time is where will you get the money? And third is having a business plan, you know, so we will need this much, we will spend this much time, and a year three, year over five, or year five, we will start making money, and we'll make start making profit. So all that calculation is called a business plan. So these are must-haves. Without this, any business is going to fail. So you have to have these things there, so. Uh, private uh, biotech startups, uh, the product, there are, as I said, there's 5,000 startups in the uh, in the biology area right now, but in, in, in India, over the course of last seven, eight, 10 years, 
many, many company have uh, started. So where do they get ideas from? So typically the product idea for these companies are taken from a published research that somebody else has published, or it is one of their own ideas. It can be both. And the financing is by private funds, usually, as I said, angel investors or uh, friends and family, very much like the way I described, and then venture funds. So the business plan to commercially is prepared by uh, people who have really, the venture capitalist will prepare a plan for you. So uh, private biotech, the whole model is very similar to the other businesses I talked, which is having a good idea, getting financing and then having a business plan. So if you're planning to do a biotech company on an idea that you have today, make sure you have all of these three because the biotech industry is very much like any other startup company uh, ideas. So. so let's take a look at out of the 5,000 startup biotech companies that are out there, I would say probably 4,000 will fail they will not be able to be successfully run a business for more than three to four years. Uh, that's a failure rate and it's unfortunate. So, so the ones that have succeeded, why have they succeeded? I think the number one thing is having a marketable idea. Again, I talked about blue aspirin and pink aspirin. That was not a marketable idea, right? So you have to have a marketable idea and product. And that assessment you can make by talking to end users, stakeholders like patients, doctors, other scientists, whatnot. Uh, the other thing, as I said, you cannot be a one-man show. Uh, you have to have a good team, uh, a team that adds skill sets to what you already, what you you have or do. A good team is very important. Um, so you will see that any company that is successful usually is not a single person company. They'll have two or three. They will be a CEO, CSO, vice president for this, vice president. So... The other thing is um, they have to be well prepared to make really tough decisions. You have to keep analyzing whether the idea is working or not. If the idea is not working or if there is no market for it, you have to be ready to kill the product and kill the company. And during COVID, this is a great example. A lot of companies that had nothing to do with COVID started to work on COVID. Some provided gloves, some provided masks. You know, so everybody started to, because there was a new opportunity. They stopped everything they were doing and started working on a new opportunity because it was more marketable. So I think this is a very tough, tough part is making a decision to kill the product or not. And uh, th this is where venture capitalists are very useful. They will provide you feedback. And also having a team is very good because you yourself will always say it's a great idea, right? So having a team, you get to see. So successful companies, again, have very ele the, the elements that you need to be successful are what I just talked about. So let's also learn why companies fail. I think the number one reason is the product is not never commercially viable. From day one, they were doomed not to have the company work because the product, they didn't do enough diligence on it. The other thing is they run out of funds before the product. So having careful financial planning raising money as needed, all that is extremely important too. The last, as I said, is not being able, making decisions based on passion rather than being rational. And this is very important for tech entrepreneurs like, like me. I'm a scientist. I don't know as much about business. You know, uh, Gopi knows more about business than I do. So I would always say my idea is going to be great, right? So that's made out of passion. So you, anybody who makes a passionate decision is going to fail in business. You know, your, your decision has to be based on what is the market thing? Will I going to make more money uh, or, or not? So this is a very common problem with uh, technical entrepreneurs like me is um, they, at a given time, we have to give up control and give it to a business person to go move forward. So that switch, companies that don't make the switch of being just a purely technical entrepreneur to a business entrepreneur, very, very are likely to fail. So you have to be prepared to make that tough decision saying, this is what I know, let me do this part. This is what he knows, let him do that part. So again, very simple common sense things, but this is where companies fail, not having a good idea, not having enough money and making decisions based on passion. So always talk to people who have other skill sets that you don't have.
The other thing I like to have is, uh, again, having a five-year plan for a startup. Um, personally, for the foundation, and I have mentioned this to uh, our team and Gopi also, um, the foundation, to me, I view it as, as a <clears throat> uh, innovation engine that we are going to develop. And I mean, we have thought through about financing it for the next three to five years. So you have to have a five-year plan. It does not happen by accident. I cannot say, Somehow next year I might somebody will give me money or somebody I'll win a lottery. It doesn't have to have. So please have a plan. Year one, what are you going to do? Year year one is discovering the product, for example. Year two is finding a partner. Year three is launching the partner. Year four is making some money. Year five could be you might be profitable. So that whole planning has to be in front of you on a daily basis, right? Without having a plan, you're going to fail. And then find mentors, you know, I mean, I still believe in seeking mentorships and Gopi, me and another senior colleague of ours meet every once in two weeks, I think, or once in a month. Why do we meet? Because this other individual has more experience than Gopi and me. So we present our data, our science, our ideas and seek another external um, opinion because your opinion is always biased. You're passionate, right? So. Even today, I've been in this business for close to 25, 30 years. Uh, Gopi hasn't been there, but we still seek. My point is keep seeking mentors. Mentors learn from their experience. And I do it even till today. We do it even today. Uh, the last thing I would say is a lot of people in science think, I got this pub paper published in Nature or Science. So it's got to be a great product. Unfortunately, no. This is the toughest thing I have. I, I sit on a lot of boards and I advise a lot of different people. And when I see an academic entrepreneur, the biggest problem I have is convincing them that this idea is not viable for a product. They will not believe it. So uh, just remember that just because it was good science, it doesn't mean it's going to be a good product. A good product means something that people will pay for. It has to fulfill an unmet need, not just a good publication. Um, the other is, as an individual, what do you need to be a successful entrepreneur? Number one, I think you have to have skill in the domain you're launching a startup. You cannot be a scientist and say, I'm going to run a hairdressing business, right? That's not your skill, your domain, and you're unnecessarily taking a risk that you don't. So whatever it is you want to do, make sure you have domain expertise that that. Um, the other is taking a calculated risk. And I'll tell you, um, when I, I was working for Pfizer and I joined a startup, I was literally the first employee in the company. And everybody said, are you stupid leaving a very nice job at Pfizer? This is in the U.S. And joining a startup who don't have more money more than two years. So, But I had taken a calculated risk. My wife was also a scientist. She was making money. And I calculated that even if I lost my job and everything, on one salary, we can still manage. And I was young, right? So I could always come back. So um, taking a risk is very important. You have to. But make sure you know you calculate what risk you're taking. Don't sell your only home and say, I'm going to put all the money in it. That's a very, very poor risk-taking decision that you've taken. So take a risk, but think through, you know, try and mitigate that risk. There is no... Come in being an entrepreneur, there is no comfort zone. If you want comfort zone, as I said, then you need to go work for a bank. You go at nine in the calm, five o'clock you're done. Saturday, Sunday is yours. You can watch TV, whatever. As an entrepreneur, and you should talk to Gopi, 24-7 you have to be thinking about what else do I need to be successful? It's never ending. It's never, ever ending. So just try and understand your own personality. Are you a nine to five guy who says Saturday and Sunday are mine, I'm going to watch TV? Or are you somebody who's prepared to spend, you know, the next 10, 15 of your life thinking about the business constantly? If you're not that person, don't get into it. So I think being a successful entrepreneur is a very unique thing. You might do a bachelor's, you might do a master's, you might do a PhD. Nobody teaches you how to be an entrepreneur, right? So this is what it needs though. This is based on my experience and Gopi can comment on this later. It's a very different skill set, right? Don't just say that, you know, my friend Vijay started a company, he's doing great. Whether Vijay is successful or not doesn't mean you're going to be successful. It needs a very, the brand of 
people that become entrepreneurs is, is very different than a normal uh, person. So just be aware of that. I think what are the few properties that you need to be successful? Communication skills are extremely important. After all, you have to convince investors to put money on it or whatever. Uh, so if you're a shy person, please learn to communicate and have clear, be clear. Uh, not just, don't just think of one idea, but you have to think about what's going to happen next year. It's called end-to-end -end picture. So, you know, you have to know, have a full idea of where this idea is going to lead. Um, I think this is very, the third bullet point is very, very forgotten. You have to think like a customer. What does a customer need? Does a customer really need pink aspirin or a blue aspirin? No. What a customer needs is aspirin prevents my heart headache in half an hour. But if, if there was something that could prevent my headache in 10 minutes, I would pay for that, right? So think like that. What does a customer need? <laughs> the other thing is you have to be resilient. Uh, there will be setbacks. I don't think there is any entrepreneur uh, who actually can say, yeah, I have always been successful. I had no problems. That's not true. And I think the final, the cheapest, the best advice I can give you is having a strong mentor. I think there's no substitute for having a mentor because uh, mentors are experienced, they are unbiased, they've been successful, they may have failed, but you learn so much from them that you cannot learn. So uh, I think this is my last slide. I really think I'm just going to summarize. This is probably the best time for an Indian tech person to be an entrepreneur. There has never been a better time. Uh, India is no longer a poor country. I mean, that's a given now. So people have more money to invest on things that uh, and buy things that they never did before. And COVID was actually a great, it, it reinvented the health industry. Uh, small and medium entrepreneurs are thriving, providing things that, as I said, masks, gloves, uh, sanitary sprays, whatever. So, uh, and finally, the government of India has doing a lot. Uh, there are many sources of funding. You should just go to the website of things like DST, BIRAC, and all of these. Um, and so if you're thinking of being an entrepreneur, this is probably the best time ever in India to be an entrepreneur, I think, provided you fulfill some of the things we have been talking about. So like I said before, the current generation, they may not even look for a job. I mean, my father worked for one job all his life. I worked for five, six jobs. Uh, Gopi worked for one or two and then started his own company. You guys, which is the next gen, may not even look for a job. You might start. So this is a great environment to be. Previously, if you said, I'm a business people, people will say, what is wrong with this guy? He's not educated. You know, <laughs> those days are gone. An entrepreneur is looked upon very respectfully now. So, yeah, I think uh, current Indian biotech I already talked is, is in a great situation. And if you want to do um, so what next is my final, I think India is no longer a poor country. Uh, if you look around the automobile industry is, is flourishing. India has been a huge contributor for the vaccines and generics. Uh, what, and we have leaders who are visionary and out of box thinkers. So I think for your generation, which is people who have done masters, this is a great time to be uh, in the business. So as long as you follow the three, four rules that I talked about, which is, you know, thorough market research, having a team, thinking end to end, having financing and all that, I think the likelihood of you being successful is never been better than the current situation. I want to stop here and see if there's any questions, but very exciting times for your generation uh, to be an entrepreneur. Very, very exciting. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, if, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to. Uh... First of all, excellent today. So it was a great oh. talk. So oh, thank you, Gopi. I open up to many of the youngsters. And of course, I could be able to learn so many things from there. So, uh, so one you're thing. A, uh... You are a great example of current day uh, generation who has given up stable jobs and become an entrepreneur. So. So you, you, it'll be interesting to hear why you did that, Gopi. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. One thing I wanted to understand from your slides for the, uh, on behalf of the youngsters, when they want to start an entrepreneurship, so as you have asked for your recommendations, you need to have at least five years plan. Yes. yes. So how do they get into that stage? They, they, when they begin it, nobody will have five years plan, definitely. Okay. So maximum, they will maximum focus on the idea. Correct. 
So once they step into this idea, how can they build? Is it like a uh, top-down approach or the bottom-up approach where, you know, so this year is this uh, pre-fixed planning might not be working in the startup can, startups, right? Yeah. So do they survive in that situations? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question, Gopi. I think uh, you have to have a plan. And the plan, as I said, can be very simple. First year, I'm going to develop the idea. Second year, I will see who will, how I can commercialize it, whether it's through pharmacy stores or through hospitals. And third year, I will start making money. So how do I price it? How do I produce it? All that. So just extend your idea into what you think is the ultimate goal of the idea, right? The ultimate goal is to produce a product. So try and connect the dots from, I have an idea to how do I make it into a product? It doesn't have to be a, a genius of a plan, just simple saying, yeah, this product will go to a hospital and this is who will make it for me and this is how we will price it. So some amount of thinking beyond the first year is very, very important. But I do want to ask you, uh, Gopi, why you started your own, uh, uh, this is unusual, now it's getting more common, but I'd like to hear your story. Oh, Thank you. I think this is an opportunity to explain myself here. So to be very honest with you, I'm an accidental entrepreneur today. So it is not that I have pre-decided to be an entrepreneur. And many of the entrepreneurs uh, will be there like me. Yes. You know, become an accidental uh, entrepreneur. So, but I had an idea. Okay. So the Snake Venom, uh, the project that we have been working on. So that was the dream idea that we I had from a very long time. I wanted to address that problem. So it was all about a problem. So, but, you know, so fortunately, we were uh, able to grab the funding from Bayrak uh, Big, and that was the initiation for our startup. Even when we get the grant, we were uh, not thinking of forming a company, but Bayrak has suggested us to form a company. But once you uh, start your baby, then you, yeah. your thinking is entirely different. Yep. You are no more a scientist, so isn't it? So. So you cannot go with one product to keep pumping the funds. So you need to have an alternative product which can generate the revenue. So that is how uh, we entered into aquaculture, where we started generating revenues yeah. so that this revenue can pump the our actual idea. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah, that is how like so we have been doing it now. Yeah, Kriti, you have a question? Yes, sir. Sir, okay. you have explained most of the things uh, that I wanted to ask. Uh, so I want to ask the same question. What inspired you to become an entrepreneur? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I've been, um, I told you about Pfizer, right? I used to have a pretty good job at Pfizer. And, uh, you know, so my motivation was I saw at Pfizer, I would never be a very senior person. My desire when I joined industry was to be a CEO one day, right? So that was my passion. I never saw myself being a CEO uh, at Pfizer. So how can I be a CEO one day? I said, let me start up with one way because even with less experience, you can be CEO. So I joined a, a startup company. I was a CSO there. Um, so long story short, my desire to be a, at a C-level executive, it wasn't the money. Money has never been important to me. And people who get into business just because they want to be billionaires are very likely to fail. The passion has to be, cannot just be money. So my passion was wanting to be a CEO level type of individual. And I thought that startups would provide that opportunity for me. Yeah. yeah. The, what you can learn and attain and achieve in a startup is far, if it is successful, is far, far more than working for large companies. So, <clears throat> and then I, you know, after doing Atrogenics, which was the first startup I did, uh, I realized the power of uh, startup. Only the other thing is world-class innovation usually only happens at startups. Uh, the large companies are too busy, you know, supporting their revenues and all. So they don't take as much risk. If you want to take a risk with your idea, it has to be through a startup. So that's the other thing. Yeah. We have a query from a research scholar named Komal. I recently read a LinkedIn post that said one toxic experienced person is better than two fresher who has potential and are efficient enough to learn. I faced a similar situation. We have a senior to report to, but this person keeps talking bad about the company, the management or the people working, which is never true. It actually changes our perspective and commitment to the company. It just affects the peace of our work environment. How should we treat such people? I, I I strongly believe that toxic uh, people are going to bring the company down. 
I've seen this happen so much uh, in my own experience that however experienced or bright a toxic individual is, if the individual is not a team player and is not able to work together with the company and its uh, and its employees, uh, you need to get rid of it, that individual. So I would never hire a toxic person versus two freshers. I, in fact, I do the opposite. I really think that young minds who are fresh are able to absorb and perform much better than a toxic individual. So yeah, long story short, Komal, I would fire that toxic individual and focus on training the freshers because really in the long run, that's what's going to pay off. You need positivity. I mean, the number one, the other thing I, uh, to be an entrepreneur, you have to believe that things are going to work, that positivity has to be in your DNA. And people who don't believe that uh, are unlikely to be either help you or the company in being successful, yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Pavan Kalyan. Hi, Pavan. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Pavan Kalyan. Hi, Pavan. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, my question is to Dr. Uday and Dr. Gopi, from both of you. Uh, I want to know, you mentioned uh, you both worked in a couple of companies before starting your own startup, right? Yes. And uh, you suggested that, I mean, like you mentioned that uh, nowadays um, many youngsters are coming up with their ideas uh, Without an experience, they are uh, brave and confident enough to start their own startups or companies, yes. whatever it is, right? Yes. So what are out, what odds or challenges they might face without any experience? And what difference it might make uh, for an individual with a couple of years experience in a tech background or uh, any other business background, starting his own company? Or uh, I can't say a recent graduate. Uh, like, for example, myself, uh, I graduated in 2021. From the past two, three years, I'm working as a freelancer. I don't have any corporate kind of exposure and uh, working experience. And what difference does it make for me to start my own company with my idea compared to an individual with a working experience? I, I think the um, working experience allows you to learn the methodology. You know, for any business, there is a process. We talked about it. So if you work for a company, you learn how businesses uh, function, how they make money and all of so that you learn. I don't think it's essential for you to really be, uh, as long as, see, where young entrepreneurs where they usually fail is when things are going good, they are fine. But when things are starting to not work, that's when they run in. So I think somebody like you, you should have a strong mentorship around you. People who have been in industry, people who have been successful. You need one or two mentors for you to mentor you and hold your hands and guide you through. Uh, working in a corporate, that would be nice. Uh, you know, but I wouldn't say it's essential as long as you have strong mentors. Yeah. Gopi can answer too, please. Yeah. Yeah, Pavan, I totally agree with you there, what you said, like, so you you need to have a mentorship and this experience. And in your case, you are already an entrepreneur. When you say like, you know, from last two years, you're working as a freelancer, True. it is entrepreneurship, right? So you just need to form a company and make it a little more structured company. That's it. Uh, actually, the thing I am working as a freelancer is completely different from uh, my, idea, my idea of uh, business. Okay, it's, but you are please know right. what are the individual uh, uh, concerns that you will be facing it, right? Yeah, so, I um, agree that. Yeah. So that is a good experience that before you just start any new business. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck. One more is... question in the chat box. Okay. Yes. It's from Vishnu. How to identify angel investors in India? Uh, there is actually an angel network. Uh, uh, I think it's called angel network. Uh, so there is a group that's already been formed of uh, angel uh, investors and uh, there is one in every city even Bangalore might have it talk to Gopi I don't know if Gopi wants you to get in contact it, but talk to Gopi but uh, really every city now has a formalized group called angel investors network so you have to contact them they may even be if you google there might be a web page there you can start contacting yeah so no sir Okay, well, you can uh, reach out to us on LinkedIn. There's an uh, I for LinkedIn page, and you can post your questions there, and Gopi and I would be happy to answer those now. So thank you for your time and being here. Hope, you know, and stay tuned. I for will have many good such uh, uh, webinars that uh, are going to come up. So, yeah, thank you.